Hey everyone, Carrie Beck here with Homeschool Coffee Break, where we help you stop the overwhelm so you can take a coffee break. Thanks so much for spending time with me. It just means the world to me that y'all will spend time with me and share this podcast. If you haven't already done so, click the little subscribe button so that you can get more of what can help you stop that overwhelm and we can get this message out to more and more people. Today we're talking about a very important topic and as I wrote on here, maybe stepping out on a little shaky ground. This is not the area that I've actually ever walked on in with this homeschool coffee break. We're talking about being a light to the world, the faith-filled legacy of our founding fathers. How can we really be that legacy of our founding fathers? And with the election right around the corner, I just felt there was a need. That's one reason. That's why last week we talked about what is Marxism and communism. And I think as you vote, you need to consider what that is and whether that's a biblical worldview or not. I have shied away from politics, but I will just tell you what happened. I'm recording this on a Monday. Yesterday on um, Sunday at church, I had a really good message and it made me completely change what I was going to do uh, for this particular podcast. Because it was really a but God thing. And I realized if Christians don't stand up for biblical truths in politics, who will? So I'm sharing some things that I was convicted of and learned yesterday. Um, and in the show notes, wherever you're listening to this, you can get a link to that full sermon. It is excellent. It is not talking Democrat, Republican. Who should you vote for? It's giving you some foundation of, of where we came from as a Christian country. If you don't think I'm a, we're a Christian country, please hang with me because I have some facts. And uh, what I'm sharing is sort of the the highlights of what I learned and what we talked about in that sermon as well. So I will share in the show notes, the city on a hill um, link, and you can go watch all of that as well. Politics, not always the thing we want to talk about. And I have seriously shied away from it, but I want to go back and let's look at the Bible. Y'all know that I believe that everything we do, including the way we vote, the way we raise our kids, the way we educate them, goes through the lens of scripture. What is the greatest commandment God has ever given us? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And what is the second? To love our neighbor as ourselves. This applies to us in our home, in our family, in our homeschool, but it also applies to every other area of work, and it applies to government. And we need to not separate um, who we are as a church from who we are as a state. So uh, I'm going to give you some history lessons to show you why that I believe that is how we were set up. But let's talk about this for a minute. Why do we or should we even have a government? Let's start with that. Then we'll go through some historical um, findings. And then we're going to talk about what should we do to move forward. So couldn't we just all live in perfect harmony? Well, most of y'all are probably saying I don't think so, because I can't even live with the person living in my house, you know. But of course not, because we're all sinners. James Madison, uh, one of the founding fathers, said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Sort of true. And some of y'all think, well, maybe because I, I've seen these other types of things. We looked at Marxism and communism last week. We saw some ways that that did not line up with the scripture. Another thing we slightly talked about was socialism. So let me just talk about socialism. Would socialism ever really work? No. Why? It assumes that we as men are inherently good. And that is just the opposite of the Bible. And it's just the opposite of truth. It is why so many countries have changed their government um, found the way they govern their bodies so many times. They keep trying these ways that aren't biblical. Now, does that mean I think the United States is the perfect nation because they may be Christian? And we'll talk about whether they really are. Oh, we're all sinners and we've all done things wrong. So I believe that socialism does not follow a biblical perspective. This is not about socialism. We're talking about our country, the United States. Some of you listen from around the world. 
Okay, y'all can go and analyze your country's government as well. So let's talk about this. Socialism isn't going to work. We are all sinners, but we are called to love God and love neighbors as ourselves. And I believe that is where we need to look for what the government is all about. It is all about allowing us as men to love our God, to worship God, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be able to love well those around us. And so I think, too, we need to also vote for laws that will help us love well. So we need to be paying attention to what does it mean and how can we love God and how can we love our neighbors? That is the greatest commandment. And I think that is the basis of how we move forward in government. But let's go back historically and talk about the pilgrims, the Puritans that came over here. They were supposed to land in Jamestown. Where did they land? First Thanksgiving in a month. They landed in Pilgrim, I mean, in, uh, in Pilgrim, Pilgrim, Massachusetts, they named that place. So they landed there and there was no king to submit to. The king's orders were all down in Virginia in Jamestown. And since they had landed in a new land, they made a choice to follow God. And they set up a governmental system that was created by the church. Okay. Now, this is a side note. Everyone's like the government says separation of church and state because the, the state is in charge. That is just the opposite. They landed here as believers. They landed here as a church to set a city on a hill, a light to the world. And so really, the reason they said separating church and state is they did not want the state telling the church what to do. Now, that's a side note. That's a little something you can go off, a little rabbit trail. You can go off and do some more research. But really, when they began, our country, the church and the state were one. And they mutually decided to create a government. In fact, in the Mayflower Compact, which was written actually beforehand, but I think it sets up what was going on. It says, in the name of God, amen. So we're automatically looking at God. We whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God, and the advancement of the Christian faith do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another to covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Hear that civil, like civics and politics. They mutually agreed that they would set this up um, under God. And that is something I think is super important because let's face it, heaven rules. God is sovereign and we need to submit to him. What is the government's primary primary role? I've already mentioned this. To allow us to freely express a love of God, to allow us to love our neighbor, love other men, that gets rid of tyranny and it actually protects our citizens. So the government has a job to get rid of tyranny and to protect our citizens because that is how we are able to love our neighbor. And it always goes back to these two greatest commandments. Where do we get them? From the Bible. So we're putting on the lens of scripture. So let's go back. And at the pilgrims and the Puritans, here's what they said in, well, not the pilgrims, uh, um, not that. Our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence had this to say, and you've heard this. Some of you have memorized this. I think our kids memorize this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government governed meaning the government gets its power not because they're the governing people but because those who are governed are giving it to them and more important by their creator as said at the very beginning this is all endowed by our creator but you're going yeah, but I don't really think the United States is Christian. Look at what is going on right now. Look at the way people are acting. Look at our own candidates. We'll talk about candidates in a minute. So instead of me trying to persuade you that we are a Christian nation, I'm going to share a few quotes. Again, these were um, shared with me yesterday in church. In 1892, this was from the U.S. Supreme Court. 
No purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people, talking about the United States. This is historically true. This is the Supreme Court talking. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation. These and many other matters, which might be noticed, add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances. Okay, that's a big mouthful. But it says all of these, that is a Christian nation. And this is what they conclude. We are a Christian people and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity. Did you hear that? Our morality is based on Christianity. Where do we get that? We get that from our Bible. We always kind of go back to that. That was in 1892. Let's go back 100 more years or almost 100. 1954. Chief Justice Earl Warren was interviewed by Time Magazine. And here's what he had to say. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior, the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge of our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it, not just a knowledge of it, but they truly believed. That's what I'm talking about. This is about really fulfilling the legacy that our forefathers have for us. We need to have that legacy. We need to show forth what the Bible is. And um, Chief Justice is saying it was all based on the good book and the spirit of the Savior. All right, let's go back to the 1800s. 1854, now we're moving not from the Supreme Court. Let's go to the Congress. This is the House Judiciary Committee. We're going to cover all three branches, just so you know. It says, at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the amendments, so this is about 70 or 80 years after that, the Congress is making this statement, uh, because they had done a, a, a finding, a study on, uh, on our nation. And they said, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, but not any one denomination. In this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. No substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the republic. And they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. You and me. That's what they expected. All right, let's move to the executive branch. The president, President Calvin Coolidge, had this to say back in the 1920s. The foundation of our society and our government rests so much on the teachings of the Bible. It would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cases to be practically universal in all our country. Can you see what's gone on and how people have viewed this for centuries, all right? Let's talk about how the world sees us, right? And let's compare this. You may go, we do not act Christian. Well, yeah, because we're sinners and we all do bad things, but our principles and our values are Christian. Our morals are Christian. That's what we need to really think about, especially as we move forward into the election. We're not voting on what everyone's doing now. We want to vote on the principles of the Bible and the values of the Bible. If you were to ask someone, what is the religion of Iraq? Muslim or even India, I think it's Hindu or Turkey is a lot Muslim. All of that Middle East is pretty much Muslim. There's no question about it. And that is how the world sees us as Christian. They do not see us as Muslim. They see us as Christian. And a lot of it has to do with our founding fathers and the biblical principles that we were founded on. In 1949, the president of the United Nations, General Carlos Romulo, said this, never forget, Americans, that yours is a spiritual country. Yes, I know you're practical people. Like others, I've marveled at your factories, your skyscrapers, and your arsenals. But underlying everything is the fact that America began as a God-loving, God-bearing, God-worshipping people. That is the President of the United Nations saying that about us. Now, there are many other quotes. I, I'm not going to bore you. Or if you want more quotes, tell me. I may even make a little document that I'll give away with some of these quotes so you'll have them. 
like I said, have we always acted Christian? No. Why? We all have an old sin nature. We are sinners. Although as a church, we need to be overcoming that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully we are moving forward. And when we vote, we don't vote because we're sinners. We vote by the values and the principles that God has given us through his word. Yeah, we've done things like slavery, abortion, but our biblical principles, our foundation are Christian. And let me tell you, our country's foundation, our, our system of government has lasted longer than any other country over 200 years because I believe because it's a biblically based um, government system. So what do we do with all of this? How does this impact us on the way we vote? Well, let me tell you, you know, Steve wrote me, a, wrote me, he didn't write me a book. He wrote it for men. It's called A Father Stew. And it was all about how we cannot turn our lives into TV dinners and compartmentalize everything. It needs to be a blend. Um, our parenting, our homeschooling, our service as a church, our family, our marriage, everything, including our politics, including our government and the way we vote. It is all a blend, like a stew. So we can't compartmentalize it and completely separate that from us. We need to remember when we go to that voting booth what our foundation is. If you're a believer, you are part of the church, the Christian church. And remember, the government was set up by the church, not the other way around. And we always go back to the greatest commandment. Let me read that to you, Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. And how did Jesus respond? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like of it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets, the whole law, the whole politic, the whole government. This is what we need to found ourselves on. Our government needs to be founded on. So how do we vote? I believe we need to follow and make choices about people that will follow these two great commandments. Which candidate, no matter whether you're voting for the mayor or your senator or the governor or the president of the United States, which one? will make freedom or encourage freedom for us to love our God and worship him. Which one will help us be able to truly love our neighbor? Let's talk about loving our neighbor. And I'm borrowing a few little examples from the sermon yesterday. You may think, well, it's not really black and white. And I'm like, you're right. A lot of times it isn't. But as my pastor said yesterday, am I loving my neighbor? Uh, or I will love my neighbor if I can ban porn and transgender books in elementary schools. That is loving my neighbor. But it's not loving my neighbor to encourage sexual immorality, especially at a young age. It's really not loving my neighbor to redefine biblical marriage. Biblical marriage is between a man and a woman. And offering sex changes, transgender things to kids that is not loving my neighbor we need to really take this down to what it is what is loving our, loving our neighbor is not just affirming them as well loving our neighbor is is standing with those who are against killing innocent babies loving our neighbor is not just affirming, but it is putting into laws that truly, one, are biblical because that's the truth and ways that we can truly love our neighbor and bring them to know who Jesus Christ is, our Savior and our Lord. So our this race, and we're going to talk about the presidential race right now and close up with this. It is really about values. It is not about a power. There are platforms and personalities. Which way do you vote? I don't know. You're going to have to make that decision. All right, but I think that you don't necessarily just vote on personality. Why? All candidates are sinners. Let's be honest. And don't say, well, this one's worse than that. No, they're all sinners and they're all about themselves and they are selfish and they are humans. And let's just name them Trump and Harris. They are sinners 
They are humans. They are selfish. They are thinking about themselves. Now, they may be saying they're talking about other people, but that is it. So I'm just saying you got to throw the personality um, card out. If that's how you can vote, bless you. You go right ahead. You need to vote your conscience more than anything. And let's also just make sure we understand every vote that's cast this year and ever voted and will be cast in the past or the future is the lesser of two evils because they're sinners, all right? So we need to really look and see what, who stands for the values that are biblical and that um, promote the two greatest commandments, to love God and love our neighbor. Now, I will tell you right now, I've heard many commercials. One of them is about saying, I am for, I support sex changes in prisoners. I will have our, ta she didn't say this, but tax money for that. That is not loving my neighbor. I have got to vote against that. People that are for abortion, that is not loving my neighbor. So you've got to vote, I believe, according to which candidate will promote us to, uh, or give us the opportunity, ability to have that freedom to love our God and love our neighbor. Rem but remember, the head of everyone is Jesus Christ. Heaven rules. God is sovereign. No matter what happens, we can put our faith in him. Don't get scared. Go vote according to what the Bible says to you. And let's move forward. There's no reason to be scared. Why? Because God has put us here on this earth. And I just read this recently in my Bible. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp with put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what this is all about, being a light to the world. You know that little Christian song, hide it under the bush, Joe, no, I'm going to let it shine. No, we need to be out there, and as Christians, if we don't speak up for God, who will? And we are really hiding the light of Jesus when we do not do that. So shine your light by voting according to biblical principles, the two greatest commandments. You have a privilege. It is an opportunity. Don't skip it. And I just encourage you to vote for truth and righteousness. We do have some resources mentioned uh, that I will put in the show notes. I'm not going to go over those, but I will say there, is, well, I'll say this. We do have an election study guide, election day. This is for kids, that, but it might help parents as well. And then the, the video of the sermon I heard yesterday. Again, we are a light to the world. Let your vote be for light and truth and righteousness. Carrie Beck, Homeschool Coffee Break. Talk to you next time.